Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, interviewing today's pioneers to inspire tomorrow's innovators. In today's episode, we are introduced to an acronym that is quite familiar in the business world, ROI, or Return on Investment. What is ROI? Return on investment is a percentage used to compare investment options or evaluate business plans. How does one calculate ROI? Using this formula, return on investment equals net profit divided by cost of investments times 100. For example, let's say you're a mid-sized company that's decided to purchase a new piece of software to boost profits. The ROI formula may look something like this. Financial gains after software purchase minus the cost of software. This is your profit divided by cost of software. Then you would times that number by 100 to get your percentage. However, here is what the formula does not tell us. Calculating factors that may be less obvious, such as time, hidden costs and fees, and even emotional factors such as stress. All these things can significantly impact ROI. The example above used costs of software, but that should not only include the hard expense of the program, it should also include factors such as time you spend exploring software options, training time for employees, and other hidden costs. Calculating ROI is not a requirement to start a new business venture, but understanding the importance of ROI is crucial for a business to succeed. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. graduate from the University of Oregon and George Fox University, where he earned his MBA. He is a former executive at Par Lumber, a current board member for the Home Builders Foundation, and the co-founder of Wheelhouse 2020. Please welcome Scott Erickson. Scott, how you doing, buddy? Good. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation. No, thank you for coming on. So let's let's introduce the world to Scott. Tell, give us a little bit of your background. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, this is it's it's interesting. I was thinking about it today when you'd asked me those questions and. Um, this is my third job out of college. I've really? only had three. The first one I flamed really hard. I went about 14 months and I was fired. The second job I had was with Par Lumber Company. I started as a cashier. I stayed at that job for 17 years. And that's really like where I got the experience. That's where I met my business partner. Um, that's where we got the foundation for my, what I call my now second career. And my second career is Wheelhouse 2020. We started that in 2010 It's a sales and marketing company, and we um, specialize in the building material supply industry. So a little bit niche, a little boutique, um, but that's our background. That's our specialty. Um, That's where we come from. And we wanted to stay in that same realm. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. What what exactly does Wellhouse 2020 do? Well, we're a full service agency. We do everything from um, digital advertising, social media, search engine optimization, search engine marketing. We build websites. Um, all in-house. We also have two other pillars that have been very strong for our company. One is representation, manufacturer's representation. So we have five or six representatives that are out there in the marketplace representing our clients' um, marketing and sales initiatives. And then we have um, our creative and branding services. And that's that's another one of our pillar or foundational pieces uh, for the company. And one of the things you mentioned um, about Wheelhouse is, is it's a pretty niched uh, industry, but advertising and marketing aren't niche. What, what do you mean by niche industry? Yeah, no, no. The, the tools that we use and the, and the products that we are employing with our clients are very traditional to sales and marketing. Um, we just keep ourselves in a sandbox that is, um, a little more narrow than some of the other agencies, um, typical agencies that you might work with. Um, our, we work nationally um, across the country, but our um, channel is in the building material supply. So we're working with dealers, manufacturers, distributors all across the country in a very specific product category. 
So let's let's talk about how Will House started. Because you mentioned this is your third job. Yeah. Your second, your first one, you burnt out, right? Yeah. Par, par was, was, was the second one. How did you jump from par to wheelhouse? It, that's it's, you know, that's really interesting too. I think, um, I started as a cashier. I've done almost every job that you can imagine with par lumber company and, and admire the family so much. Um, the individuals in that organization groomed me. They taught me, they gave me all of the resources of their organization and allowed me then the CEO of par at the time, um, was I think very fairly progressive and he was allowing younger employees onto the leadership team. So I joined the executive leadership team at age 30 and um, had experienced a lot of different things from their manufacturing side to leading their sales organization. Um, And that's um, I think what started my career with par lumber and what prepared me for learning their systems. They, they're very much a a systems process and procedure operationally driven company and organization. I'm getting that foundation, that corporate foundation helped my partner and I, and that's where we also developed our foundational pillars for wheelhouse 2020, the theory and the idea that really led to the success in our current company. Nice. And so, so you mentioned your partner. Yeah. How, How did, how did you meet your partner? So she, she she was at Par for 17 years also, and uh, she was the director of marketing. When we left Par, I was on the sales side and, and leading the sales team, and she was the director of marketing. We worked together um, for many years at Par Lumber Company. And, and in the uh, late 90s, we started looking at the challenges that the sales team had that the, and the marketing team had. And we noticed that the organization was built in silos. So marketing's over here, sales is over here. Um, sales is not interested in what marketing was doing. Marketing had no interest in getting any kind of opinions from sales. Um, we wanted to do some, some specific things on the sales side. She wanted to do some things on marketing, um, but we weren't getting a lot of traction and, you know, and so I would talk to her about, Hey, you know what? I want to start a sales program. And she's like, you know what? We need to brand the company. We need to, we need to look at new product segments. We need to do the new customer segments. And I'm like, I, I just need some tools for the sales department. And it was through those conversations that we really developed a integrated sales and marketing approach. And we took that philosophy straight to wheelhouse 2020 and it became the foundation of our, our sales and marketing agency. And that's the way we don't consider ourselves just a marketing company because we don't develop marketing programs for our clients unless there's a sales component, unless there is some kind of um, tangible ROI that we can adhere or fix to the marketing campaigns. Um, And that's why I think we saw some success um, and have had some success is because we can really point to some strong marketing campaigns that produce results for our clients. So when you, when you decided to create wheelhouse 2020, what problem did you kind of set out to solve? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's funny. Um, first of all, the, the problem we wanted to solve was the silos because we believe that, that many organizations are built in silos, operations, sales, marketing. And so we wanted to tear down those walls. That was our first, the first problem. And and then where we saw we had a unique niche. And when we started this company, it was 2010. Um, So we had just come out of one of the most, you know, horrendous recessions that our industry and and many other industries had seen at that time. And we we were told by um, a lot of our peers that we were crazy for going out on our own. Why why on earth are you doing this? Um, What could you possibly bring to the Organ of the industry that hasn't already been done. And how are you going to make a living when people aren't spending money on marketing and sales right now? They're letting go of all their sales and marketing people. And that was, that was our um, opportunity. That's what I saw as our opportunity. I said, you know, well, yeah, all of these companies have let go of their sales and marketing people. So they need to outsource. They can't stop selling. They can't stop. Even in a recession, you can't stop promoting your company. You can't stop promoting your products. Um, and you can't stop selling. That's the one thing that's going to bring you through. Um, but they, we also knew that they couldn't afford to hire back a lot of headcount. So if we could provide a solution for those clients and we could do it at a lower cost, um, then we felt like we had a competitive advantage in the marketplace and we could grow some business. Um, you know, and that was so that's the theory. You know, the, the, everything starts with a theory. And um, so it was that combined with the let's break down the walls in sales and marketing and create an ROI. Um, We also thought that we had some canned or um, preset pre-made marketing campaigns that we could sell. That was a bad idea. Um, And and you'll find is, 
you know, in our organization, you always, you're going to come up with five or six bad ideas for every one good one. Fortunately, business is forgiving, you know, and, and you can have some bad ideas when you're, when you're building an organization, if you have enough good ones to help, uh, help offset. So, um, that was, that was kind of the, uh, the, the start of it. That's it. So how, how in the advertising world do you create ROI? That's yeah, yeah, very carefully. <laughs> So no, and aggressively. Um, so I, I think in, in our opinion, in our company's opinion, and everybody does a little bit differently, you know, it depends on the industry you're in. It depends on the products. It depends on if you're going straight to the consumer, if you're going, we work B2B, we work from businesses to businesses. So the companies and clients that we work with are selling their services to typically other businesses more often than they're selling them to the, the direct consumer. And so the, um, So when we're looking to create an ROI, I think there's a couple of things that are absolutely essential. One, I think you have to have some kind of accountability in your, the sales team or in the organization leadership team of the clients that we're working with. They have to have some kind of accountability, some kind of skin in the game. Um, They also have to have some kind of visibility. And that means they have to have the tools in place, the foundational tools to be able to see um, if their programs, if these programs and if their sales teams are actually implementing them, executing them and getting some kind of results from them. So and then you need to have the um, knowledge and commitment um, from the salespeople. So that's where we where we integrate. So we'll start to develop our campaigns, whether it's a rebranding campaign um, with a sales component, whether it's a product uh, promotion, whether it's a some kind of uh, program, new campaign or program. And then we'll say, what visibility uh, play? Uh, what visibility tools do you have in place? If they don't have them, then we help them create them. What kind of accountability do you have on this program as an organization? What kind of commitment as a leadership team do you have to implementing and executing a marketing campaign? If they don't have that, then we walk away. Honestly, um, we have to have a commitment from the organization, and then we have to say, okay, let us work with your sales team to develop key performance indicators and, and for a client. And because we want to identify the holes in their organization or the challenges before we just go out there and say, okay, we're going to charge you whatever for a, a big campaign um, that may or may not work. So that's, that's where the integration I think of the sales and, and marketing comes in for our company. And for the listeners at home that may be unfamiliar with the acronym ROI, what we're talking about is return on investment, right? right. Yeah. And so, so as a business leaders, right, that's, that's essentially what you are going for right? as an entrepreneur, how important for you, one of the things you mentioned, right, is being in a, a niche market. How important was you, was it for you to make sure that when you focused on your company, that you remained something that you had a bit of a knowledge in already or an expertise? Um, I, I it, because now, now we can move outside of our industry, I believe. Because we have processes in place, we have procedures in place, we have a lot of the things that we didn't have in the beginning, um, and we have some name recognition. Um, we have a little bit of street cred. Um, so we have some things underneath, some successes under our belt. I think we could move outside of our industry. Um, in the beginning, it was really important because our name recognition, my partner and I nationally, was the foundation for our new business. We were um, we did a lot of speaking. We did we worked on panels both nationally when we were at our previous company. So when we came out on our own, um, a lot of the clients that we have now had already known our name. They had there was a lot of name recognition associated with it. Um, so it was important that we stayed in our industry in the beginning to help us grow that business and to capitalize on some of the things, the expertise one that we had and, and the experience that we had. So originally with Wheelhouse, um, did you stick to your initial idea or did you shift or pivot to something else or a variant of it? Well, we've, we've pivoted several times and I think that is the, um, is that one of the important factors of being an entrepreneur or starting your own business is the ability to recognize when something's not working and to capitalize and take opportunities that you see that are working. Right. And that's that's what makes maybe entrepreneurs a little bit unique or a little bit different is that they're always you by necessity. You're always having to evaluate what you're currently doing and your customers will tell you whether or not you're on the right track or not. If they're not buying it, um, then, you know, you need to pivot. And so we had when we had started, we had thought these canned, um, you know, kind of pre-made marketing campaigns or packages could be sold in non-competing markets all across the country and we could do it at a low cost. 
Um, we could just say, here's your marketing campaign in a box. Here's your sales initiatives. Here's your campaign to go along with the promotions and with all of the branding and all of the uh, collaterals and everything that you would need. Uh, no one bought that. Um, they didn't want it. They didn't like it. Um, we kept trying it. We were trying to push a, a, a round peg into a square hole for a while and realized that, you know what, maybe our niche is to customize programs for each individual customer and each individual cu- client. And once we did that pivot, we made that move and adjustment. Um, we got three or four new clients who were excited about it. Um, so that reinforced our, okay, now we need to move in this direction. One of the other things that we did, we hadn't had intended in 2010 to really get into website building, um, get into social media, get into um, search engine optimization. There are a lot of companies that were out there that were doing it, the $99 websites, all those kind of guys were like, that's not really our interest. Um, another big monumental switch for us was when we determined to take that inside in house and say, okay, you know what, we are going to do that and we're going to do it in a big way and we're going to focus on it um, because our industry really needed it. You know, you mentioned, you know, during that moment when you had a, had a pivot because you're realizing what you're trying to offer your customers wasn't what they wanted. Right. Was, was that a defining moment for your team and saying, you know what, we're finally on the right track or was there a different moment that was like, you know what, I think we're this, this, venture is going to be successful. Um, that was, you know, that was before we even had a team <laughs> game. We had, it was my partner and I for the first two, two and a half years, it was just her and I. And, um, I think our first monumental, um, challenge or change was when we, we read a book called the E-Myth entrepreneurial myth. And it was Michael Gerber who wrote that book. And it really, the, the essence of the book was you got to stop working in your business and you need to start working on your business. And when we started working on our business, started looking at it from the outside, because once we got, we, we forgot everything, all the corporate lessons that we learned throughout Par Lumber Company, once we got out on our own um, and we're flying, um, we forgot a lot of those things. And so it was um, important for us. We got right into it. We dug into some of two or three of our clients. We started working inside the business. I was on the sales side. She's on the marketing side. We're producing our stuff. And we we had forgotten to really look above it. And so we read that book and we're like, that was an aha moment for us. And we're like, okay, we need to start working on our business. And that was um, the first, first pivot change. And then we hired a person from that one person. Well, within, um, we went two and a half years with just the two of us. We hired our first person, started working on the business. By the end of the second year, we had nine people. Um, So we were, um, that two year, 24 months later. So it really um, made a huge change in our philosophy, in the way that we looked at the business and where we started then capitalizing. We could see now some of the opportunities and started moving our company in that direction. During that process of, of, you know, creating Wheelhouse, was there ever a moment of self doubt or in either the company's growth and success or even your own? Um, wow. That's, yeah, you know, there's always, there's always doubt. Um, and I am a, I think I, I consider myself a paranoid person because I'm, I'm a salesman, right? I think that every single person that is alive is trying to take the business from us. And, um, so I, I am always concerned about, What's happening next year? What's happening the year after that? You can't, it's hard to enjoy successes sometimes because you're always afraid of, is this going to end or are we going to find out something or do something next year? COVID was a perfect example. I mean, we've gone through some external things that have really impacted our business and had, we've had to pivot um, with, with that. So uh, of course there's some self-doubt, but I think, um, well, I know that we always knew it would be successful. Um, we had a tremendous amount of confidence in each other. My partner, Jennifer Swick, and I, um, a lot of trust. We've worked together in a long time. Um, we had confidence in our team. Once we started to build up the team, um, we knew that we were hiring the right people, that we're doing the right things. Um, so we had a lot of confidence that we were going to be successful, and we were seeing a lot of success. But there's always that little bit of paranoia. And I think if you don't have that, if you aren't um, always concerned about it, um, then uh, then maybe you... Maybe you, maybe you aren't an entrepreneur. I don't know. <laughs> now I want, I want to take a step back and kind of talk a little bit more about Scott. Cause one of the things we we're talking yeah. about when we first, uh, when you first got here was you grew up in Hermiston, Oregon, Yeah, a very yeah. small rural community, similar to myself. How did that kind of help? Cause now you're talking about, you know, your work ethic and your sales. 
How did, uh, you know, growing up in very rural community kind of shape you today? Yeah, I, I think that's, I, first of all, I, I loved, I loved growing up in Hermiston and in the, uh, in the late seventies and eighties, um, you know, it was, it was a very, very good place to, uh, to grow up riding your bikes and, and it's a small town, it's a small community. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs in small communities, right? Every business, the gas station was run by a family and the farms are run by families and the, um, plumbing, the plumbing companies and the plumbing store and the clothing store that we went in Burnham's that we went and bought our clothes at was a family run business. So you grew up around your friends and families being entrepreneurs. My dad was an entrepreneur and he, he owned a restaurant and then, um, and a building material supply location. Um, and that's where I got a little bit of my background, a little bit of my experience. So he, he had run both of those businesses in our local town. Um, so I think growing up there and seeing all of your neighbors at the football games and seeing all your neighbors at the restaurants and the sense of community and support for small business certainly gave me some passion for it. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, growing up in those small, small rural communities, it, it's just you kind of you kind of make do what with you have, you know, and, and, and sometimes when you uh, need the assistance, you call the neighbors and they tend to be right there. So. You know, going through it, uh, what is what is something that you learned, you know, starting this business um, that you wish you probably would have known before you started it? Oh, that's a really good question, too, Gabe. Um, I think I wish I had known that it's easier than you think to start your own business. Um, you know, when you, when you're standing on the edge there and you're trying to decide, are am I going to leave my corporate position? Um, or, or am I going to leave the company that I'm with, or am I going to leave the job that I'm at to start my own business? It, it takes a lot of confidence, you know, um, and you're looking at it and you think there's just this entire huge cliff that you're about ready to step off. And then when you take that step, it's, it's, it's jolting. It's like a curb. You're just like, Oh, that's it. Okay. That, that that's not that bad. I can do this. And so, you know, I, I even gained a, a lot more confidence. So I wish I had known sooner I probably would have started this business um, with Jennifer. We would have started it sooner had we known that it wasn't as terrifying um, as as it as we thought or expected that it was going to be. Yeah, and and looking looking kind of back on it, what advice would you give either your younger self or younger individuals thinking of becoming entrepreneurs? Oh. Um, be ready to um, be ready to put in the work. Um, I think that's if I were to give myself the advice and we did, I mean, that was certainly something we were, we worked weekends, we worked evenings, um, be ready to put in the work, um, be patient, um, but be diligent. Um, the, there were a lot of times that we thought, okay, you, you, maybe this isn't going to work. Um, you had mentioned that earlier about self doubt. You know, there were a lot of times that we had questioned ourselves. There wasn't a, a, a lack of confidence in our ability. It was just like, did we have the right model? And the next day we would get a client and a client would call us. So you never know what's around that corner. So if you're just patient and you stick to your, um, your goals, um, I think that, um, that would be the advice. And then the other thing that I would probably give myself, um, I, another book that really changed us was, um, traction. And a lot of people have read the book traction by Gino, um, uh, Gino, uh, I'm for spacing his last name, but um, anyway, the, the book Traction talks about visionaries and it talks about um, uh, integrators. And my partner is definitely an integrator. She is a taskmaster. She has tons of lists, um, check boxes. She is extremely organized, extremely detailed, and I'm more of an, a visionary. And so I was always looking for the next, okay, this, I, I got an idea. I got an idea. This is an awesome idea. And someone told me early on, you know, every idea is awesome until it isn't. And I think that the advice I would give myself is stay in your sandbox because that's the advice that she gave me in the beginning. Um, don't try to jump out until you can, you have, you have the ability, the resources and the systems in place to um, be successful. But I was always thinking that I had the next greatest idea and it had it not been for her saying, hold on, hold on. We, we're doing a really good job right now in our sandbox. Let's stay here right now. Stay in our lane um, do what we do well, execute well. Um, we always have a time for to take another opportunity, um, but maybe this one isn't it right now. 
Let's let's talk about your partner for a little bit because you you yeah. hold her at a very high esteem. Oh yeah. So how important is she to your success? She is everything to our success. Um, it, going into business with a partner is is scary in itself. I mean, you have so many things that you need to be concerned with professionally. If you can't work personally, um, those are the professional obstacles are almost impossible to overcome. And we knew that we could work together. We had worked together before, but we had not worked together one-on-one. We were in two different areas of the corporate office, two different um, sides of the building. We never sat in the same room together. So we had to get to know each other on a very personal level. And, um, but I have a, she's brilliant. Um, she's an incredible marketer. Um, she is creative. She's a, she has vision. Um, she's detailed. Uh, she has um, really complimented our uh, my, my, my deficiencies and the things that I don't have. Um, we had a client, one of our first clients say to us, um, after our first meeting said, don't ever break up. You guys are so good together. Um, and, uh, we really have taken that to heart. We, we respect each other. We work in our respective areas, but we don't, but we do it together. Um, make a lot of the same decisions and we come to a lot of the same conclusions and sometimes we don't. And then we have to, uh, you know, negotiate. Love it. Love it. And it's just like marriage. It, oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> so tell the guests at home how, if they're interested, maybe they have a company that maybe needs some of your service. How do they contact Wheelhouse 2020? Uh, from our website, it's probably the easiest way, wheelhouse2020.com. And uh, we have a contact us form right on there and uh, you can get a hold of us. Uh, we have, um, we don't charge anything for a consultation. We'll sit down and talk about your organization from operations to sales to marketing look at all the different silos, um, look at the tools and resources and the foundational pieces you have. A lot of people, you know, um, it's interesting. We have a lot of our clients who come in and want to start right with social media or they want to start with search engine optimization and search engine marketing. And, um, they want to start putting ads out, um, on the internet. And, and we're like, you don't even have the foundational pieces in place. So we'll, we'll go back and we'll look at all of those things to make sure that our clients have a successful experience with us, um, before we'll just take on a client. And who, who would be considered your typical client? Um, a, a company like Par Lumber Company. Matter of fact, when we left Par, Par became our client. Um, the day after we left, they hired us back, um, and they became our first client. Actually, so lumber yards in the uh, in the Portland market or nationally, um, we work with distribution companies and manufacturers. Like some of you might recognize Fiberon, which is a uh, a composite decking company. They're one of our clients, um, and uh, companies like Millguard Windows or. Um, uh, Louisiana Pacific siding. Um, those are, those are companies that we would work with nationally. Wow. All right. Last question. Uh huh. Would you do it all again? <laughs> In a heartbeat. Absolutely. 100%. And I think this, uh, what I love about what you're doing right now, Gabe is it's, it's so appropriate because there is a flux. There's a change in the market right now. There's a lot of talented, brilliant people that are in transition from their companies because of COVID and, um, so if I were to give any advice, um, I would say, yeah, take this opportunity right now while you're in flex to look at the opportunities to, to start your own business. And there's a gap in the, in the entrepreneurial channel, I think, between this small business association where we started that helped you with your um, getting your LLC and getting all your logistics. It's, it's, it's helpful, but it doesn't teach you or tell you how to be an entrepreneur. And then you have the entrepreneurial organization, EO. Um, So those are two very good organizations, but there's not a lot in the middle. And that's what I think you're providing right now is a resource for people to say, okay, I'm really thinking about this. I'm not going to get what I need from the SBA. I'm not a member of EO. Where am I going to find out if I want to be or can be an entrepreneur? And what are some of the pitfalls and challenges and opportunities? And that's why I think your service is so valuable. And and this is why I love having these conversations because I think you said it best earlier. uh, You know, it's, it's not as scary. The jump is not as big. It's, it, it really is. It, if you have, if you have um, a good idea and you have um, confidence and you really want it, yep. you, you can make it happen. Everybody has a good idea until it's not a good idea. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> All right. Scott Erickson, the founder and co-owner of Will House 2020. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com. 